right. Thank you all for being here this evening. Um, we are going to start with the roll call, please, when the clerk is ready. Test. Mayor, I'm having a slight feedback issue. Just a moment. For those who aren't here regularly, we also run the meeting via WebEx, which is what you're seeing on the screen. And sometimes the audio for that can be a problem as well. So we got to make sure everyone can hear. Mayor Dexter? Here. Deputy Mayor Carr? Here. Councilmember Meyer? Present. Councilmember Miller? Here. Councilmember Schroman Warren? Good evening. Councilmember Schwab? Here. Councilmember Suggs? Here. Deputy City Manager Goings? Present. Attorney Bloor? Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. If you can rise as you are able for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, I am going to stay standing. My microphone is really loud. And ask um, Dennis and Mike if they can meet me in the front. All right. Um, thank you all for being here this evening. Um, a number of people are here because of this gentleman standing beside me. Um, and it is my pleasure and honor this evening to recognize um, Dennis Edgington for his um, years of dedication to the city of Port Angeles, to our customers, and um, to thank him and wish him well as he enjoys more than just today, apparently was his very first day of being officially retired and not having to get up for anything. So um, I'm sure he'll find like everyone else that his calendar will fill up quickly, but it will maybe be with things that are a little more fun. So. I did get up at 3.30 this morning. Okay. So no rained. Well, we'll hope for you that that changes at some point. <laughs> or you can get those early flights. Um, so I have a proclamation to read this evening. Um, and then we'll um, hear a couple words from our director of public works. And, and then if Dennis, Dennis, if you want to say something as well, you're welcome to. A proclamation in recognition of the public service of Dennis Edgington. Whereas Dennis Edgington began his career with the City of Port Angeles Public Works Department on April 1st, 1988. During his next 36 years, worked in the streets division and then the water division, eventually becoming the water distribution lead worker. Whereas his dedication to deliver safe and healthy water to the citizens of Port Angeles has shown consistently throughout the years. The number of times his life has been interrupted by storms, water main breaks, and providing customer service are innumerable. Dennis also spent 24 selfless years as a volunteer firefighter with the City of Port Angeles Fire Department. Whereas Dennis has over many years provided leadership and tutelage to multiple generations of utility workers within the water division. He consciously built meaningful relationships throughout all the other divisions within public works as his coworkers retired or transferred and Dennis opted to stay behind to pick up the pieces. Whereas whether it was supervising a busy construction site, managing a large scale water event, or lending a hand to another division, Dennis brought a unique ability to bring order to chaos, to lead and to make good decisions under pressure. Dennis has assumed an outsized role during these events due to his skill and competence. Whereas Dennis, through many years of solid work and accomplishments, has gained the respect of his coworkers and supervisors, his ability to provide the citizens of Port Angeles with clean drinking water and the way he provided excellent customer service to all those affected during outages has not been lost by his peers. It goes without saying that his supervisors and colleagues always slept well at night knowing Dennis was on the job. Now, therefore, I, Kate Dexter, Mayor, on behalf of the City of Port Angeles, City Council of Port Angeles, and Nathan West, City Manager, on behalf of the City staff, with great appreciation for his service to our community, 
do hereby approve the retirement of Dennis Edgington. His public service and dedication will be missed by all. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we have a framed, signed, sealed um, copy of that for the original of the proclamation for Dennis, as well as um, a city coin. So nice. thank you very much. And I'm going to hand the mic over to okay. Mike real quick. Thank you, Mayor. I remember Dennis as a, as a water guy myself. <laughs> I know a couple of things. There's always a water break on Christmas Eve when the family arrives. There's always a water break when the wife's birthday comes around. This is a celebration not only of what you've done and what you have meant to us as a city. Every time anybody turns the faucet on, they put a lot of trust and reliance in you and your coworkers. But it's also a celebration of your family and what they've given up over the years. I want to thank them. I want to thank you. I'm really proud of what you did while you were here, even with that fire department stuff. <laughs> But, but that is a good training ground to graduate to public works. Mm -hmm. Dennis, thank you again. It's a pleasure working with you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Director. Appreciate all the kudos and accolades and couldn't have done it without my wife. She makes me smoothies, very healthy ones, so I have plenty of energy to get to work and back home again. My crew, some of them are here tonight, my boss, their bosses' bosses, everybody here, and the taxpayers, thank you. Thank you for paying my wages, for putting up with me and having trust in me. I appreciate it, and thank you for this. This is more than I deserve. Okay, don't run off because we'll don't run off because we'll take some pictures real quick. Oh. So if we can get a picture with you, and then we'll have your crew come down, your family come down. We can do mix and match, however you want to do that. Okay. If someone has a camera, that would be sorry. I didn't plan that part. <laughs> Thank you, Calvin. All right. Thank you very much, Dennis. Thank you, your family. And if you guys want to go out in the hall, you're welcome to hang out and take some more pictures. We'll give Mike a few minutes if he wants to join you. Turn that alarm clock off. <laughs> All right. Excellent. I think I'm already too old to put in 36 years anywhere at this point, so it's quite an accomplishment. Oh, good. All right. Um, we will move on to public comment. Um, there's no one signed up for in-person public comment, um, but we do have some folks online. If you have public comment related to any of tonight's agenda items, please raise your hand now. If you are joining via WebEx, you can click the little raise your hand feature at the bottom. And if you are a call-in user, 
dial star three. And we don't have any call-in users tonight, so. And we do have a second public comment period at the end for um, items that are not on the agenda. If anyone has something along those lines they'd wish to speak to. I don't see any hands, so. Um, just pause another minute because sometimes if you're new, it's hard to find the find the button. All right, I don't see any hands, so um, feel free to join us for the second public comment period if something strikes your fancy. Um, we have a guest this evening, so I'm going to move that presentation up. Um, Colleen McAleer is here to give us an update on the EDC. Thank you, Colleen, for being here tonight. There. Hmm. Colleen, just give me one moment here. I'm getting logged in. Okay, thank you. So um, my name's Colleen McAleer, and I serve as the county's executive director of the Clallam County EDC, Economic Development Council, the state and county designated economic development agency for Clallam County. And I really appreciate the opportunity, Mayor Dexter and council members, to share with you some of the work we've been doing over the past uh, about 15 months, I think, since I've last been here. So as soon as the slides pull up, I will get started. Okay, Let's see, there we go. So um, one of the first programs I'd like to discuss with you covered tonight is the BOOST program. Uh, we applied for the funding from the State Department of Commerce in actually 2022, and of uh, over 100 applications, our application was rated number one. So we were really excited about that. And the purpose of this was to, we received $1.3 million to help under-resourced, underserved businesses in a three-county region that was Jefferson, Clallam, and Grays Harbor to serve, provide them services. And those services were marketing services, uh, bookkeeping services and legal services. We found that, however, when we went out to bookkeepers, bookkeeping firms, that the, they didn't have any capacity. They said, there's no way we can do anything for you. So we realized that we were going to need to partner with Peninsula College and Grace Harbor College to have them train up bookkeepers. We um, The colleges were concerned that we wouldn't get enough applicants, but we did. We hired some really great young people actually to do TikTok videos, Instagram, and we had 20 slots for training bookkeepers. And uh, we ended up having 384 applications from the three county region. So, but if you think about it, somebody that wasn't currently working, they would be able to work from home, take care of their kids. We were providing them um, a computer stipends for a five month period and then setting them up with businesses where they were paid $50 an hour. So they now have um, clients that they continued to work with. We, of the 20 we started with, there were 18 that um, successfully, successfully graduated and five of those 18 are in the city limits of the city of Port Angeles. So you have five new bookkeepers from that program. Additionally, we served um, 278 underserved businesses. We targeted Hispanic communities, tribal communities, those areas and those businesses that didn't have uh, the resources and we hired four, no, I'm sorry, three attorneys, um, 21 marketing firms, and then 18 bookkeepers and set the, them up with contracts to service and provide uh, expertise to those 278 underserved businesses. So that was a huge undertaking for 2023. It took up probably, I don't know, 30% of my time, but 80% of some other staff members' time. But I think in the end, it was really a great program. And um, we ended up getting an award 
let's see, whoops, I think I might have gone too far forward. We ended up getting an award from the Washington State Economic Development Association for that program for um, an innovative project for the state for 2023. So we were really proud of that. Um, another area of work that we do year in, year out, that we receive funding for from the county, the state, um, and our city partners is business retention and expansion. In uh, 2023, we served 168 businesses in total, uh, providing business retention and expansion uh, advising to them. And that varies from things like uh, supply chain support, business planning support. Uh, 34 of those businesses countywide were startup businesses. And of those 34, the bulk actually were from the city of Port Angeles, 29 of 34 we're in the city of Port Angeles. And existing businesses in 2023, there were 68 businesses uh, that were received BRE, we call it business retention and expansion services. And the next area that I wanted to cover was our work in the North Olympic Apex Accelerator. Um, it, this was something as I'm a former veteran and, or I am a veteran and uh, a, I had a woman-owned business, and also we are a hub zone. And so I had, for years, tried to get support from what was called PTAC, the Procurement Technical Assistance Center, and could not get any support. I had to end up going to the Olympia office to get any support. And I shared this frustration with Congressman Kilmer that we were not getting these services. And so he had DOD, that was the funding agency, check into it, and they found that not only in the last year had they not, the local uh, PTAC office, which was um, out of Kitsap County, had they not served any any businesses in Clam, Clallam or Jefferson counties, but going back two years, they hadn't, three years, they went back 10 years and found they had only supported three businesses in Jefferson or Clallam counties. So he agreed to um, advocate for us having our own funding. And so we now have the North Olympic was PTAC, they've decided to change the name of the program to Apex Accelerator. Um, and program-wide in 2023, we served 97 businesses with our program manager, and now we also have a um, counselor in addition to the program manager. So we received $345,000 annually to in that program where in 2022 it was zero. So that's a big success. and the purpose of that program is to get small businesses, con federal, state, and local government contracts, but also to train our local governments about how they can, with low risk, hire local businesses. So we believe it's been a big success, and we think that that program is just going to continue to grow. Um, and please, if you have any questions, feel free to ask as I move through this. Um, the next is the uh, Recompete grant. Uh, I was really proud that the board of which Nathan West serves on, on behalf of the city of Port Angeles, voted to invest $80,000 to support the Recompete phase one application. There were 500, you, I'm sure heard, there were 566 applications nationwide and 22 were selected to move forward to phase two. Ours was one of those and ours is the only one in the state. Additionally, we were, um, we've received a million dollars so that 80,000 is definitely paid off, 500,000 from the state for the Securing Federal Funding Initiative and the strategic development grant funding that that the coalition between the two counties received um, from the Economic Development Administration that's part of the U.S. Department of Commerce. So now, of course, we're working on phase two, trying to get to the big $50 million prize. And we um, the, the portion that the Clallam EDC is focused on is the natural... Nat Natural Resources Innovation Center. We call it NREC. Um, that, so far, 
from private, state, and federal funding, we've received $625,000 for that that will run through 2026. But we are also applying for funds through Recompete Phase 2. And we have been designated, NREC has been designated as an innovation cluster accelerator program by the state and by uh, EDA, the Economic Development Administration. So it is an industry-led uh, industry center that drives innovation, business growth, and the a large intention is to get existing citizens of Clallam County and Jefferson County into the workforce. Why did we pick natural resources? because we know that in Clallam County, the highest wage sector, even higher than government wages, is in forest products. And so we are trying to help that industry grow, not just in jobs, but also to support forest health and innovation value-added products in Clallam County and Jefferson County. So um, the areas that we're working on uh, include local value-added product innovation, so advanced materials, manufacturing processes, and also moving advanced CLT uh, applications forward, which include accessory dwelling unit uh, innovations, biomass production, um, energy production, and biochar uh, production, specifically here in the city of Port Angeles with minocarbon. Um, so we're doing a lot of studies for them. These will be publicly available, but it will help uh, across the board different types of businesses that need this kind of work that individually they would never invest in on their own. Um, then also improve forestry practices with private, state, and federal uh, on federal lands. We met with the U.S. Forest Service just two weeks ago in Washington, D.C., and they're interested in a pilot program with NREC uh, to promote improved forest health using AI, data science, digital mapping, and uh, data for decision-making, also including automation, robotics, equipment advances in logging and milling, methods to minimize the disturbance of soil and compaction during logging operations. Pauline, yes. I think you're... You advanced one slide Did I? too Thank far. you. Thank you. Um, and uh, uh, let's see, feasible wildfire resiliency practices. The, a lot of these uh, practices are already in existence, but it's just the small forest landowners don't necessarily know about it. And so we're, we're going to be working with them to promote these different practices. And um, small timber farm tech solutions, water information and accounting, climate resilience, and regenerative plant planting. So I'll move on to the next. Um, child care expansion. This is a, a, an area that we've worked on for since 2020. Um, we've received numerous grants, and now we're kind of backing off of this getting grants ourselves and supporting the YMCA and supporting Shore Aquatic Center so that they receive the grants. But what we were able to do in the early years was to um, apply for funding to expand those entities that weren't maximizing the number of children that they could take for one reason or another. Maybe they didn't have the right kind of um, equipment for children. Maybe they didn't have uh, the necessary fencing that they needed. So we paid for those kind of upgrades and created 80, addition, 80 additional child care slots in 2022 and 2023. And then in 2023, we worked specifically with Clallam Bay School District and create, because that was a child care desert, there was no child care providers in the area at all. And now there is the Clallam Bay Early Learning Center at the Clallam Bay School District. That's a new LLC, and they are um, caring for 30 kids now at that location. So we felt like that was a big success for their community, certainly. 
Um, we also did the five-year countywide strategic planning process. We finished that in 2023. That's on our website, plalum.org. Uh, five-year plan. It's a 159-page document, which is pretty dense, but if you're interested in just a single part, it will take you just to that section. Uh, it, we divided it into 14 different clusters and evaluated the uh, economic impact of that particular cl cluster. Next, uh, we market to our county and businesses. Nearly 7,500 people receive our weekly newsletters. Uh, we do weekly coffee with Colleen's, uh, and um, we did in 2023 18 training events, and we advocated with the North Olympic Legislative Alliance. We hire Josh Weiss from Gordon Thomas Honeywell, um, and we have representation from the city of Port Angeles on that steering committee. And next, um, Grant administration, uh, in 2023, we helped administer $535,000 worth of grants, uh, disaster grants, $180,000 of that went to businesses in the Port Angeles area. The majority went to businesses in Clallam Bay, CQ, and Forks that were most impacted by um, weather events. Next, uh, we now have a team of seven employees. It's a really strong team. We couldn't get all the things done uh, without every single one of them. And um, I'm, it's just a pleasure to work with them. And, um, you know, between our director of operations, we've now done multiple single federal audits and without findings. So, you know, it gives us the ability to, to pursue a lot of really great grant programs. Uh, Mitch Kuntz came from Jamestown Squalm Tribe, and he's our communications specialist. Rebecca is our program manager of, uh, of Apex Accelerator. Gabriel Bugarin, it came from Puget Sound Energy as their technical writer and communications expert. Um, June Claypool works uh, high, um, doing grants for us right now. She's working on um, grants for Clallam PUD out in the West End. And then lastly, Dr. Dan Underwood is our research scientist and economist. So um, that wraps up my presentation, and I would love to share more. If you have any other questions or interest, um, whether it's here tonight or at a separate meeting, we are here to serve, and we really appreciate appreciate the $30,000 investment that the city of Port Angeles provides to the Clallam EDC. It represents about 4% of our ongoing run rate um, of expenses and revenues. So we do appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Colleen. Um, I see a question from Amy. Go ahead. Um, excuse me. I'm going to start out with a comment. Um, I actually know an individual who is now um, trained in bookkeeping and is a small business owner in Port Angeles who um, not too long ago was also uh, unhoused. Uh, and so I think that's something um, that is to celebrate. And it leads me to my question is that you said you had 329 applications for that program and had 20 slots. Could you speak a little bit on how you were able to narrow down that field. So we had um, a group that represented Peninsula College and um, and people from Jefferson, EDC Team Jefferson, our EDC, and Grace Harbor. And the first thing that we said is we can do no harm. So we really picked the cream of the crop applicants. I would have loved to have had a much broader program with more time to train people. Um, but yeah, there were a lot of disappointed people. Um, and again, what we're doing with the Recompete grant, we've talked about the success of Boost and how that can be replicated through some of the work we're doing in workforce training with the college moving forward with our Recompete application. Thank you. Any, oh, Latricia, go ahead. Um, I just want to say congratulations on the APAX um, de developing that new program for Jefferson Clown County. I remember talking about the TPAC 
and the the staff in Bremerton. So I guess my question on that was, what was the lesson learned that over 10 years, only three, what was the holdup? Was it staff that directed it, chose not to direct it to the counties? Yes, I'll tell you exactly what it was. So um, EDA, no, I'm sorry, DOD, that's the funding agency, requires a local match of 40%. And so Kitsap government was providing the 40% match. And they were telling their EDC that housed the PTAC program, your priority is helping businesses in Kitsap County not these other counties. They're not putting any money into this program. And so uh, when I talked to the executive director at the time of the Kitsap Economic Development Alliance, he said, listen, we're not going to support you guys out there. You need to get your own PTAC if you want support. And so I shared that with the head of the PTAC program in Olympia, and she said, oh, I'm really sorry. I will help you personally. And that's you know, what we would end up doing is directing people to a limp, to the one person that was willing to take those businesses on. Okay. Well, that, that that's great. Congratulations. I think that's really great. I remember you talking about that um, earlier when I got on, like, 2020, 21, you were talking about it. But um, another question I have is the recompete. So congratulations. We've moved from phase one. Now we're into phase two. What are some of the um, words of wisdom from from the funding agency side saying you have a really strong um, package, but these are things that maybe you should tighten up at that that we is there anything that we as council could do to help move that along? I know that there's a long list of projects. Yeah, and how do we get that successfully through? That we were just discussing that today at our grant writer meeting. Um, so we, you can have up to three to eight projects. NRIC is one. Governance is another. Um, there are four job creation projects. And then there's barrier removal and workforce training. And um, what the feedback we got from phase one is this is a really well-supported application. We had 49 letters of support. But they said, you've got a very large geography. You have a very complex governing structure. You've got a lot of entities involved. And you are talking about supporting four different industry sectors. It's too much. You need to narrow down your story. You need to have a story that you can tell that if, if only we could fix this, then everything would blossom and be wonderful. And so we've really recognized that we need to narrow it down to maritime and forest products. So we've had to let go of some of the ideas around, like dental hygienist was one that they called out, that they said, that's an outlier. That doesn't fit in your story. So um, we've gone back to the drawing board. We also are really focusing on our underserved communities from Quilcene, Brennan, Forks, and our five tribes. And we are putting a lot of specific funding into those sectors because the entire intention uh, around equity and is to ensure that there, we're meeting that goal and that we get the 25 to 54 year olds that are not in the workforce that are struggling into, back into the workforce. So um, that, it was good input that they provided. And through the Innovation Cluster Accelerator Program, there have been experts that have come to Port Angeles to work with us at our um, ecosystem team meetings from Finland and Norway that have done this over and over again. And they really recommended that we as NREC needed to focus. We needed to pick one industry sector and work on that and not spread ourselves too thin. So we got the same message again, and that's the way we're moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments or questions? Brendan, go ahead. Yeah, great job. Uh, the NREC stuff uh, looks great. I love the, um, it's like um, you're bringing um, more technology into a, an aging industry, which is gonna bring more uh, different other uh, auxiliary industries maybe around it. 
Um, my question is to you, it's more of an opinion question. <laughs> One of the big things I think that we deal with uh, out here is the lack of housing. Do you think the, um, what, what do you think the economic viability of an industry coming in that would produce workforce housing is in Clown County or the city? Per se? Yeah, we, we have been pursuing entities like Green Canopy Node that does uh, mass timber housing, really innovative stuff, vertically integrated, um, and they have not expressed any interest. So we think we're gonna have to build it locally. And there's a lot of need, obviously. So as Congressman Kilmer says, why not here, why not us? And we are pursuing um, we're, you know, partnering with NPBA, partnering with the Composite Recycling Technology Center to try to create ADUs locally, um, using our own workforce, using our own uh, entrepreneurs, and providing the wraparound services that they need to be able to be successful locally, but starting smaller and letting them go through the crawl, crawl walk, run, process so that they can be successful. But like the idea of like a company coming in and building some houses is probably not economically viable for our... Um, I think, I mean, I've been working I with... other stuff though. That, that all sounds really good. Yeah, I've been working with um, multifamily developers mm -hmm. and um, uh, uh, Mr. Goings has also been in touch with them, I know, where there's so many policies of the city of Port Angeles. It just makes a lot of sense. Um, the ones that I've talked to most recently have been more interested in the city of Squim because of their demographics and the rent that they feel that they can achieve there. But once they enter into uh, our area and become more accustomed to the subcontractors and they feel more comfortable, then they've talked about doing some affordable or workforce housing in the city of Port Angeles because of the great policy um, lineup that you have for your city. Thank you, Colleen. Thank you. Drew, go ahead. Uh, just real fast, um, can you remind us, for Recompete, we're not allowed to actually have stuff associated with housing as part of the grant process. Is that correct? That's correct. We cannot use the funding to build housing, but we could use the funding to build manufacturing that happens to build housing. And that's specifically the part that I'm most excited for is the composites and getting wood from the tribe to then partner with uh, PA, and I think Port Townsend either does or will have um, permit-ready plans as well. So to get that chain from A to Z and go back to a Sears Roebuck catalog-style housing, I think will be very beneficial. Yes. That's the vision. Now we just need money. The, mi the minor details. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Any other comments or questions from Council? Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming this evening. Oh, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Colleen, I just wanted to thank you for all the good hard work that you're, you and your team are bringing to the, to the county and our community. Especially, I want to highlight the, uh, the program that Rebecca runs where we, every few months, it seems, we get together with a bunch of contractors, large and small, and we we try and break down those barriers of how to bid on public comments, and or uh, contracts, rather. And we in Public Works have contracts large and small, and and it brings a couple of tremendous benefits. Not only are we seeing new players in the game, which tightens up everybody's prices to the benefit of the city, um, but I think Nathan, uh, Manager West, recently reported on one of your coffees that the amount of local contractors bidding on our stuff is up tremendously, as is the number of uh, successful bids. So that's employing local people without a buying preference and it's uh, it's helping to uh, to expand our economic base and I thank you for that program well thank you very much yeah, as a, an elected official at the port for years I would find myself so frustrated when we would get responses to RFPs and none of the responders would be local and the port didn't even say where the the um, bidders were located, and I made them change that. 
and I'd say, you know, I'd growl, and <laughs> none of these are local. When are we going to get local companies bidding on our our really rare economic development dollars that for building capital? And so I'm. It's been a it's been a uh, pet peeve of mine that I'm really excited that we're making some progress finally. Only took ten years, but you know, pleasantly persistent eventually pays off. Excellent. I'm going to end with some alliteration. <laughs> oh, Latricia has another question. Go ahead. Just a follow-up question. I want to tack on to that. Does that training also include going after National Park Service federal grants? Yes. So our yes. Projects too. Olympic National okay. Park, you name it. Any kind of federal, state, or local government. Okay. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Which she's uh, now gotten up last year. There was... Uh, I believe it was almost $14 million that she was instrumental in helping businesses bid on projects. Yeah, I'm always talking about, you know, we've got small minority businesses and federal FAR acquisition has programs for minority owned, mm -hmm. eight hub zone mm -hmm. and all that and, and to go after them. So I'm always reminding people like, if we got a federal yep. Olympic National Park, go after all of that. Right, so, right. So. And Thanks. now she is focused on getting people OMWBE certified. That's the Office of Minority Women Business Enterprises and getting them HUBZone certified so that they can, when they do bid, they have that extra little, yeah, certification to get them ahead of their competitors. And i got to tell you, that's frustrating. I'll go out and look for the minority-owned because our grants require it. And the response is, well... I'm the owner and I'm a woman. I go, but are you certified? Right. And the answer is normally no. Right. So she is working with those people to get them certified. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate your time. I look forward to hearing from you again soon. All right. That brings us to late items. Does anyone have any late items? I guess I should ask staff. Are there any late items from staff? Mayor, there are no late items from staff. All right. Any late items from council? All right. Then we'll move on to the consent agenda. Is there anything anyone would like to pull from the consent agenda? Is there anything anyone would like to add to the consent agenda? Amy, go ahead. I just want to note that the uh, council minutes were minorly adjusted. Oh, right. Um, and so I think what we want to approve is those new ones. All right. Yeah, I would like to add some items. You go ahead. Um, I'd like to add uh, J1 and J2 to the consent agenda. Any objection to that? Okay. Then I will read the consent agenda. The City Council Minutes, uh, the corrected City Council Minutes of March 19th, 2024. The expenditure report from March 9th, 2024 and March 22nd, 2024 in the amount of $3,120,853.65. Interlocal agreement facility use sharing, utility construction agreement work by WashDOT, US 101, and State Route 116, North, Olymp North Olympic Peninsula, remove fish barriers, UTB 1564, pad mounted transformers bid rejection, MEC 2024 09, interlocal agreement for shared duty chief services, refurbishment of distribution transformer service agreement. Multi-Agency Interlocal Agreement for Hazard Mitigation and Climate Planning, Cemetery Software Purchase Project Number IT-0416, Contract 2024-04 Marine Drive Pavement Award Construction Contract. Any comments, questions, or a motion to approve? So moved. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda as read. Any last comments, questions? All right. Anyone opposed the, to the motion to approve the consent agenda as read, please state your opposition. Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. And that brings us to item H1, and I'm going to go to Serena for that. Good evening, Madam Mayor and City Council. So this next item seeks council authorization for a $1.5 million interfund loan between the water and solid waste divisions. Um, this was planned and discussed in the 2024 budget process, as well as in the cost of service analysis that occurred in the fall for the solid waste uh, utility rates. 
Um, and it's important to note that these funds will be utilized from a restricted water reserve that's comprised of National Park Service uh, settlement funds that may only be used for rate stabilization and capital means. And to date, the city is currently using those funds for both of those items with an approximately one or $6.2 million reserve remaining for this loan. And so as a result, this loan will not impact water rates or the water operating reserve. Uh, this loan is necessary to offset settlement costs that occurred in the solid waste fund while keeping the uh, solid waste rates affordable. And utilizing an interfund loan as opposed to going out to the open market is more efficient and affordable as it allows the city to use an averaged interest rate from the investment pool rather than a current market rate and provides um, benefit to both the solid waste and the water utility funds. And so tonight staff is recommending council pass the resolution approving an interfund loan between the water utility fund and the solid waste utility fund in the amount of $1.5 million. And I'm available for any questions you may have. Thank you, Serena. Um, I'll go ahead and read the resolution and then open it up for questions. A resolution of the city of Port Angeles authorizing an interfund loan from the water utility fund to the solid waste fund. All right, comments or questions from council or a motion? Go ahead, Amy. I'd like to move that we pass the resolution approving the interfund loan between water utility fund and solid waste utility fund in the amount of $1.5 million. Second, Brendan. All right, any discussion? Go ahead, Lindsay. There's a lot of financial stuff in the background that this will deal with, but on the ground, does it mean that we won't have to drive out to the dump to? Recycle our glass. Thank you for the question, Council Member. At the moment, we're, um, we are still uh, trying to identify funds to buy additional uh, glass bins. Um, so we are looking at that program. And one of the things that uh, uh, I don't know if it's good news or bad, we we are not meeting the um, the level of deposit that we envisioned, so the trucking is down. So we are looking at buying additional uh, additional glass bins and expanding that program, hoping to get better, more participation. Should we add an extra sixty thousand in here and borrow it from the water? I don't. Or do you have that covered? I don't think that's necessary at this particular point. But I'll remember and come back to you if it if it becomes apparent that it is. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions from council? All right. Um, we have a motion to pass the resolution approving an interfund loan between the water utility fund and the solid waste utility fund in the amount of $1,500,000. Anyone opposed to the motion, please state your opposition. All right. Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, that brings us to council reports, which I think we haven't had in a long time. So, um, so I'm not saying that as a dare to be as long as you can, but just acknowledging that people may have some things to report because it's been a while. <laughs> um, so, um, I will start uh, with Brendan. All right. Mine's usually the shortest. So good, good job. Um, so I think, uh, what I want to talk about is the uh, public transport, uh, clown transit, um, Man, I think we had uh, on the old council report, it was 25% increase. And now at the new council report, it's 40% increase since we passed a couple of them. So we're seeing a really big utilization of our public transit system now that we've gone zero fare. Um, I think that uh, it's just wonderful. I mean, dri just driving around or walking around, you can probably see more full buses, more full bus stations, families getting on the bus together. So it would be really interesting to see uh, what those numbers look like after the summer, uh, because and and to see like if we're if we if we see a diminishing uh, number of people um, driving and 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 using the bus and seeing how the traffic congestion might lighten up as well during the summer. So I'm really excited to sort of see those numbers. Um, the Chamber of Commerce passed their budget. They're still reeling from the tobacco of uh, the summer skate village, which really wasn't a a, a great. Uh, shining thing but uh we uh, they they did make up a lot of ground with the winter ice village um so uh and there's also the uh april 17th the volunteer fair which they started last year um uh, which if you're a nonprofit organization in port angeles um you're looking to recruit volunteers 
uh, come down and set up a booth there. I think it's free to set up a booth. Um, could be wrong though, double check me on that. I'm pretty sure it was free. Uh, but you know, it really great to, the, the great idea to have uh, a fair, like a job fair, but for volunteers, because there are a ton of people in this community that really wanna lend a hand when they can. Uh, and also the big spring spruce up is May 5th. That's uh, when you know everybody goes downtown and uh, they do the um, flower pots and clean up a lot of the brush and stuff. You'll uh, probably see me there on my little unicycle. I like to carry big buckets of dirt and take them to get rid of them or, or move them around. Um, the other uh, part of my report is the uh, Peninsula Area Public Access. They are um, working on like trying to get a good strategic plan going. There's been a lot of uh, stuff happening um, over there, trying to really um, figure out what the next step forwards are. So I think they're working on a strategic plan. Um, they, in the last couple of years, bought a um, a new server and um, that puts out uh, all the content uh, to Wave Cable and then also to the app. Um, they're contemplating doing maybe a name change and then also trying to get out of the fire station because the utilities actually cost quite a bit at the fire station. So um, they're going to try to uh, work something there. So, um, and I think that is going to be it for my council report. All right. Thank you, Brendan. Amy, go ahead. Okay. I'm going to see if I can interpret my notes from two months ago. I attended a utility advisory committee meeting. Um, I was also able to attend a um, training with our staff on surplus property for um, the use of affordable housing. Uh, that was interesting. Um, you know, I've been signing up for all sorts of ad hoc um, committees. I was able to do a buy along with um, the fire department. And um, I think the big takeaway there, um, other than um, they are a really good bunch of folks um, that work really hard is that the, I'm going to call them the Lucas CPR machines are um, really valuable. Um, I won't get into all of that, but just really valuable as far as uh, life-saving and um, the ability to have, I guess, less, um, less CPR trained um, individuals that can participate in that um, machine. I also went to the housing task force meeting um, where we are still um, working on identifying individuals who will be working on the five-year homelessness plan for the county. Um, we did get unofficial um, point in time count results. Um, which um, indicate a increase in the number of unhoused individuals in our county from 214 to 274 counted on that one particular day. Um, and I wrote PAPD crime is down. Um, that had something to do with an email that was sent um, with the report from the state um, indicating that both violent crime and um, other malicious, malicious mischief type crimes were also down in the state. Though we are um, second in Washington state for um, overdose deaths um, and that just continues to rise on the daily. Um, I was able to attend the State of the City presentation and the Peninsula Housing Authority Strategic Planning, um, which also uh, you attended um, to participate in that event. Um, I was honored um, to be able to present a recovery-friendly language presentation at Peninsula College. Um, as well as the um, Olympic Community of Health um, also did a, uh, a much longer, more in-depth training on recovery-friendly language to help to decrease the stigma associated with substance use disorders so that more people can reach out and get the help and treatment that is needed. And along those lines, I wanted to share with um, the public who may be interested is that um, in a substance use disorder field, um, 
like 30 years ago, the American Society of Addictions Medicine developed this assessment criteria that's used to um, assess the type and intensity of treatment that's needed for folks with substance use disorder. Um, we call it the ASAM. And uh, at the end of last year, they have added a additional access to that assessment tool, which is actually a very big deal. It is now um, assessing recovery housing and recovery support services. Um, so uh, what that means, I think on the ground, is um, that eventually insurances will uh, cover recovery housing. Um, so that is a really big deal in my world. Um, I don't necessarily think we will see that until 2026, but uh, I think we will hopefully be able to support that in any way we can. I wanted to let you guys know that there is an adult mental health first aid training coming up. Um, Peninsula Behavioral Health is holding that. It is free. Um, the next one for adults is May 23rd, and there is one also for youth mental health, which is April 27th. Um, hosted at the uh, Shore Aquatic Center. So you can reserve your space um, by going to Peninsula Behavioral Health. And my last thing is that um, for our next meeting, I will not be in the country and I will be asked to be excused. Thank you. Thank you, Navarra. Well, I feel like after so long, there's, you know, both feels like a lot of things to say and also you know, where to even start. Um, so I will keep mine short. Um, NODC welcomes our new board members. Um, we had some people rotate off of our board this year and some new folks rotate on um, because it's a bi-county, it's Clam and Jefferson counties. We try to keep an equal number of, um, you know, elected folks versus non-electeds and also um, solid representation from both Clallam and Jefferson County, so no one really feels left out or like, you know, there's, um, I mean, really kind of what Colleen was talking about earlier about how, you know, when you have, um, you know, one county that's overrepresented, maybe the other county doesn't uh, see as much support. So we try to have um, a pretty even distribution of our board members. Um, so we have a, a uh, the new executive director, Paul, from the Port of Port Angeles joining us, and um, somebody from uh, Jefferson Healthcare. So those are pretty exciting new people to have on the board. Um, I was uh, elected to uh, remain as the secretary of that board. Very exciting. Um, and because it's a new board with new members, uh, with different schedules, we have done a lot of virtual you know, email-based meetings. We always meet virtually because two counties, best to meet virtually. Um, but uh, so we've been, you know, still trying to figure out when our executive, executive board is going to meet. Um, so that's kind of been the exciting part is conducting a lot of email votes, um, but exciting to, you know, sort of get that uh, figured out and to meet to start meeting again as a team. Um, I got to attend an event around, um, you know, celebrating the efforts that uh, the city helped do with um, helping to uh, ensure that um, our water supply was protected um, and got to hear from some folks. Latricia spoke and was very eloquent. Um, and I uh, got to hear from um, you know, other uh, supporters and people who have been instrumental in that effort, including Representative Chapman. Um, I also attended the February pool board meeting I had to miss last month. Um, so I'm going to let Latricia mostly take that, except to say that we um, her really working on some really exciting things around child care um, that I think will... I, I really do believe will be um, like transformative for our community. Um, and Latricia and I, as part of the board, got a tour of the facility that we're that we have to to do this childcare facility at, which is our neighbors uh, right next door, um, at the old school board OMC building. 
um, that I had never been in prior to that. So that was fun and really cool to see sort of the vision for that space um, and the different opportunities that exist there and kind of the weird funky layouts on um, both floors. And, you know, it's always fun when you get to see um, a building sort of at its first steps um, and then, you know, eventually see it at the end steps. So I'm pretty excited for that as well. Thank you, Navarro. Lindsay, go ahead. There's a lot to say about what's happened. I don't really want to talk about that. So let's move on to policy and how we address what's at the um, top of the EDC's strategic plan. The five-year plan was um, the results of their community survey. And the top three challenges were one, housing, finding suitable housing that is affordable to rent or own, two, healthcare, access to quality healthcare, and three, employment, finding a job that will allow one or more that will allow one to meet their financial obligations, which I think ties back into housing and affordable housing. Um, so we don't have enough housing units in Port Angeles. I think we all know that for our residents, and we're not solving that problem through building new housing at the scale needed. Uh, that means that we need to continue to look at how our current housing stock is being used. The census's most recent data for Port Angeles, the 2022 American Community Survey five-year estimates, estimates that there are 9,930 housing units in Port Angeles, with 843 of those units vacant. That's 8.5% of our housing stock, although there's a margin of error in the census data that is 2.1% for that. So, you know, 8.5% plus or minus 2.1%. Uh, the census's definition for vacant housing unit, I think, is a valuable definition and one that we could use in our own policymaking. Basically, it's a housing unit is vacant if no one is living in it at the time of the interview, unless its occupants are only temporarily absent. That definition does have extensive details about when a newly constructed unit gets counted as uh, vacant housing. Basically, when does it get counted as housing? And then also for blighted properties, the definition includes, quote, vacant units are excluded if they are exposed to the elements, that is, if the roof, walls, windows, or doors no longer protect the interior from the elements, or if there is positive evidence, such as sign on the house or block, that the unit is to be demolished or is condemned, end quote. So with about 843 vacant housing units, we have a lot of potential housing that is going unused for housing. It is not serving the purpose it was designed for, we do want some percentage of vacant housing as people do move around, but long-term vacancy is something our community cannot afford. For the health, safety, and welfare of our residents, we need to help this vacant housing get back to doing its purpose, which is housing our residents. So long-term vacancy doesn't benefit our community, and it also probably doesn't benefit most of the people who own it. So I was looking into this and, and the idea of, of property ownership leading to wealth accumulation. There's a 2021 study by researchers at the Federal Reserve of Cleveland that compared the capital gain from housing ownership to stocks and bonds and found that home prices have grown much more slowly than the S&P 500, for example, or even an average investment grade corporate bond. So that was true even for San Francisco home prices, which they compared to as well. Maybe Port Angeles home prices have accumulated faster than San Francisco's over the last 30 years. I'd love to hear from local experts on that. Um, but while there's a widely held belief that owning real property is valuable wealth accumulation, most of the people who are sitting on vacant housing in Port Angeles for the investment value would probably be making a better return putting their money somewhere else. It's not our job to save people from bad investment decisions, but when those decisions also hurt our community by denying residents a place to live, we should take action to incentivize occupied housing units. I would note, I think the um, point in time count estimates that Amy shared with about 250 people. And here we're talking about even that low end, 8.5% minus 2.1%, we're still talking about twice that number of housing units just in Port Angeles compared to a point in time count for the entire county. So, um, so what I would propose for this, and I'm throwing this out now because I, I want to have this conversation with council colleagues, with our staff, with stakeholders in the community, um, but what I would propose is a small fee that grows over time so that it doesn't harm short-term vacancy but does create a strong incentive for not sitting on unoccupied housing for the long term. So for example, and this is just point of starting point, start the vacant housing fee at $1 a month and have it double every month 
that the property is vacant and also automatically forgive the fee on the last six months of vacancy so that nobody is caught by surprise by an exponentially increasing fee. A policy like that would mean that someone who leaves their housing unit vacant for 12 months would have a $63 fee. Someone who leaves their housing unit vacant for 24 months or two years would have a $131,071 fee. I won't even mention what it'd be after three years. Nobody would wanna do that for four years. There are easy remedies for vacant housing units. So it's not like people are stuck or stranded here. You can rent it, you can sell it. Uh, these actions can be done within a few months, at which point the fee is negligible or non-existent. Those remedies would help restore our existing housing stock to its purpose as housing, which will greatly benefit our community. So at this point, I just wanna throw that out. I look forward to further conversation. Um, and you know, when we have a housing shortage, it's important that we build what we need. It's also important that we don't lose it out the back end by not using our housing for what it's for. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Drew, go ahead. Thank you. Um, just to dovetail real fast, if we have a conversation about vacant properties and how we wanna go about that, I would like to throw in commercial properties as well on that list. Um, since it's kind of the same idea, if your business has been unoccupied for the last four years, why? Um, so if possible, adding those two together if we decide to talk about those. Um, so yes, this is actually my first council report. Since our last council report was in December, before I was actually assigned anything. Um, so let me see if I can condense three months worth of stuff into two minutes or less. Uh, so I, as well as Lindsay, did the AWC Action Days um, back in February. Um, that had a lot of good uh, training. It was good to meet other um, council members and members of other cities and kind of find out what is um, unique or difficult for us is easy for others and vice versa but also kind of learning a little more about the process as well as making connections. So that was really nice. Um, one of the committees that I'm currently serving on is the Olympic Peninsula Tourism Commission. Um, that has met, I and Ben Stanley from the planning department both serve on that. Um, our, we've only had two meetings so far this year. Uh, they basically have just gone over um, upcoming events and things of that nature, so we're aware of them. Uh, our next meeting, which is normally scheduled for this Thursday, is actually canceled. So we will not be having that. Um, however, most of my time has been dumped into the North Olympic Peninsula Recompete Coalition. Um, so that's actually, I'm the one on Recompete for that. Uh, I had to check my notes. We've met 10 times so far this year. So we average uh, about every other week and the final due date is um, the 25th of this month. So we're actually scheduled every single week this month to meet for Recompete. I am not going to get into a summary of where we're at there's about 400 pages of documents in the Dropbox file right now. Um, sufficient to say, thankfully Colleen spoke at least from a county perspective of what we've been working on and what we're aiming towards. And I already commented, one of the things I'm most forward, uh, looking forward to is the, um, if we manage to get uh, the composites tied in with the tribal um, wood, tied in with the permit ready plans and having that as basically your old, order a house from a catalog style system to be able to get ADUs in place in town uh, quickly and efficiently and inexpensively, hopefully. Um, but there's still a lot of work going on. There's something like three dozen of us, I think on the committee. Um, speaking of which, I'm on the subcommittee for that as well, for the job creation subcommittee that Mike French uh, is the chair for. So I'm also been meeting for that as well. Uh, and then we report back to the main coalition um, of any sort of findings or things that we want. Uh, right now we're going through the checklist of any last minute things that we feel need to be done and kind of showing everything up. Uh, our grant writers have been working on that since basically February, they've been working on writing the grant. Uh, however, the rest of the stuff I've been serving on, um, much like some of the other council members, I'm serving on multiple ad hoc committees at the moment. Uh, I am the chair for the ad hoc committee for the boards, commissions, committee appointments. Um, our next meeting for that for LTAC is uh, this Friday and followed by next Friday. And then uh, those of us who are on the Neighborhood Association subcommittee, which I don't know if we ever actually had a name for that one, um, but uh, we did narrow down the meeting time frame, and our first meeting um, for that will be this Friday. I think that covers everything 
that I'm actively involved in with the city at this time. Thank you, Drew. Latricia. So I'll start with uh, the, the favorite one, um, William Shore Memorial Pool um, um, Board. And just to, um, we found out that, um, or um, the, the director, um, Steve, had um, heard that we did receive the funding that we requested for to start um, expanding child care. So um, we're looking at um, two age levels, um, um, 80 spots for older kids that are um, after your after school program. So that hopefully we'll be able to start here this, um, this fall. So we'll be expanding the after school program by 80 slots. Um, and then starting in the spring of 2025, we will be expanding from like three to five, like your preschool age, 80 slots, but we're looking at all day. Um, and, and so this is the first time that they've done the younger kids. So it's going to take a little bit more time to develop the programs and the um, hiring the staff. But this is a partnership with also the hospital because we are using the old Port Angeles School District admin building, which is now owned by the Olympic Memorial Hospital, and I believe they're leasing it to us for a dollar. Um, so that partnership is allowing um, the pool to expand their already successful after school program. So I think that is going to be huge for a community um, because they already have a wait list, people that want to get their kids into the program. And as we know that, um, you know, the city Port Angeles, any parent, single parent, um, not, you know, or you got two parent households, everybody knows you just can't find a spot for your kids in, in daycare um, in Port Angeles. Um, so this is going to be fabulous. Um, and it's going to kind of partner with, uh, not partner, but um, the YMCA with their program, they're actually focusing on the younger kids, like your your infants and babies. So so they'll have slots there. Um, so uh, we see that there's things happening, which is, is really great. But that the building over here does need to be remodeled. I didn't realize how large it was when we were doing the, the tour and stuff. Um, so it is a very large facility. Um, and... Um, most of the work, I believe, we're going to be kind of trying to do in-house and see how much we can get done so it's not too expensive. Um, so that's William Shore. The other thing, um, I attended our Solid Waste Advisory Committee meeting, um, and that was really interesting. Um, they talked, um, Department of Ecology had a presentation, and they talked about um, a, a kind of a new things that they're doing. They have this little program that they're um, expanding and trying to get additional funding to market and talk with communities to talk about or to come up with ideas um, and encouraging small businesses to think about what they call downstream and upstream end of products. So like um, upstream is before a product is developed, you know, think about how it's going to be disposed of. And then, so what can we do to um, make it better for the environment? And then downstream is, you know, what, um, how, how can, we reduce the downstream product so we're not exporting as much out to be disposed of. Um, so like you asked about glass, I mean, they talked about glass recycling, which is really hard because there's just so many different types of glass um, and the cost to do it, where you have to ship it to, because here we locally, we don't have anybody who uses glass. And so all of our glass has to get shipped out. Um, but so this Department of Ecology um, presentation was really in um, informational. Um, I did send it off, send it to Mike. Um, and then um, we also 
um, talked about the solid waste management plan is due to be um, um, reviewed. And so they were going over chapter five at the last meeting. Um, and so I'll work with Mike more on that, on recommendations um, for this, um, for the um, review and, I don't know, can't, words aren't coming to my mind. Um, just the review of the plan so that it, because it was 2021 and it's got to be done every five years. So, um, so that was um, part of um, the discussion. Um, but I, I think it's even as us as users and consumers, I think it's important too that we communicate with our community to talk about ways to reduce what you're consuming and what you're sending out to be disposed of. How, how can you purchase things? Can you buy things in bulk? Can you, instead of individual single water bottles, can, can you use your re reusable mugs all the, all the time instead of individual um, water bottles? Um, so I think we as consumers, uh, for the benefit of our watershed, need to think about that. And then I also want to jump to talking about our watershed, I still want to remind people that the state of Washington and Clallam County, we still have an emergency, a drought emergency going on. Our drought emergency doesn't end until June of 2024. We are seeing less snowpack, less than even last year. Um, we are seeing, you know, um, I mean, we had a pretty mild winter. I mean, and so I think our snowpack was at 71% of what it was the year before. Um, so I imagine um, in, the, in my work that I do working for the tribe, we are already talking about having to address drought conditions a month sooner than we did last year. So have, you know, in the Dungeness, we're talking about pulse flows happening one month sooner because we predict that droughts are going to happen sooner than they did last year. So I just want to remind people, conserve water. If you have a garden, have your barrels where you can um, store rainwater and, and tap in, into that during the summertime. But it looks like we're going to be looking at a sea of brown grass. I enjoy my ground my brown grass. I don't have to mow it as much. So, um, you know, just a reminder to our community that it, you know, install low flow shower heads and faucet heads and uh, the community city potentials. We have those available. Just come on down and ask for them because again, we're going to have another drought year, and it wouldn't surprise me um, that we just kind of roll into another twenty twenty five. 26 year of droughts. So droughts still continue. Okay, so I've talked about solid wastes. Oh, um, Clown County MRC um, participating. Um, I've participated in the subcommittee about developing um, what we, um, a um, process to engage Clallam County commissioners and other parties that bring issues to the, Clallam County Marine Resources Committee um, for input. Um, sometimes if it's a permit that um, say Clallam County would like MRC input, we're developing an actual process for that to happen. Um, and, but I haven't had, um, for the regular MRC meeting, I haven't had a committee meeting. So there, there's a lot going on. Um, and I'm sure it might be mentioned, maybe Calvin might mention it, um, about the um, the ribbon cutting ceremony for volunteer field. So I'll let you mention that instead of me. But um, please make sure we conserve our water. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Um, I won't rehash everything. I don't have much to rehash anyway. A lot of my meetings are um, by email, as it turns out, or... Um, Anyway, um, Faro has their big fundraiser coming up 
um, on May 10th. So we've been spending time talking about that at our Faro meetings. Um, another nice thing is that since we have an IT manager again, I was able to connect the um, Melissa, the executive director of Faro, with um, Eric because um, our they still rely on our systems for phone and IT, and there have been some glitchy stuff going on. And so um, having some fresh eyes to go down and someone who can um, who's got the capacity to help with that will be really nice. Um, and I think I mentioned this at a previous council report, so it's been a while. The um, Law Enforcement and Firefighter Disability Fund uh, Disability Committee, um, by butchering the name, is still looking for members to get us to a solid quorum on a regular basis. So um, this is, I guess, mostly to staff if there are retired firefighters and or law enforcement officers who are PERS-1 who might be interested in serving. Um, let's see about getting them on the committee. We, we represent, the city of Port Angeles represents the largest number of um, retirees on that, but that that board serves. So um, we're in it for a while and we wanna be able to serve them well. Um, and I'll stop there and go to Calvin. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. In your packet, you'll notice an update on the city council phone uh, discussion from your previous meeting. There's also a public works and utilities grant and loan status report, as well as a consultant report. And I'll toss it to the parks, recreation and facilities director to give a quick update on this week's festivities. Thank you, Madam Mayor, council. Um, today, Jessica Straits, our communication specialist, uh, sent out a, um, a notice for a ribbon cutting ceremony at Volunteer Field on Friday on April 5th. That's this Friday. And it's going to be in between a um, JV and a varsity game. So we're trying to look at between 12 and 1230 is the estimated time frame. And we hope to see you there. Go ahead. Do you have a I just want to ask point of clarification. How many of us are planning to attend for notice requirement? Because I might go. Um, I'll probably go. Well, our subcommittee meets at time. 12, so at least three of us won't be there. Okay. I guess I need to leave my mic on. Um, all right, I have a quick, so um, if you could just raise your hand for me really quickly. If you are online and wish to speak at this second public comment period, that is where we are now. If all of you raise your hand that are online, I'm going to have us take a five-minute break. If nobody raises their hand or only a couple people, then I think we'll sit through um, and in council chambers, anyone want to speak at second public comment period? Okay, just one. Um, all right, I've got three hands, including council chambers, two online. So we'll take those three. And then if more people raise their hand, I'm gonna have them pause and we'll take a quick break. Um, but I don't see any reason to take a quick break if we can be done in just a couple minutes. So James, if you wanna come on down, we'll start in council chambers and then go online. You're good. Hi, I'm James Taylor. I live here in the city. Um, my friend and neighbor talked about um, unused housing. I think that's a great idea. One of the things I think I heard you say was the fee was started a dollar and double rather than some by another dollar. Because if you're doubling fees every month, then that ends up being two to the 29th, which is a huge number at the end of two years. So I I think what you said doubled, but, or maybe that's just what I heard. Um, the other thing I heard and have question about is the houses that aren't habitable. And maybe, you know, that's coming around in the future, but I didn't hear, you know, what the action plan for those are. And, you know, you and I can walk down, you know, the alley between third and fourth and just see all kinds of crap that can just barely stand up. So. You know, it would be really nice, both from an environmental point of view, from a fire hazard point of view, that we start addressing some of these uninhabitable spaces. Um, then thirdly, I only said I had two items. Um, uh, what you mentioned, when I was on planning commission, we really would have loved to be involved, to be your ears and your eyes and your legs to pursue this. Um, you know, planning commission was quite an adventure and it always seemed like we only heard about stuff kind of after the fact. So, you know, 
for the benefit of the future planning commission, I really think they would love to be involved in something as you're describing. All right, hey, thank you. Thank you, James. Um, we'll go to S. Blake online. Hello. Hi, we can hear you now, so go ahead. I'll start your timer. Thank you. Susie Blake, Party Angeles resident. Um, thank you. I've been listening and folding laundry, and there's some parts I'm going to go back and listen to again later on the recording because a lot of interesting topics were discussed. So um, nice work moving forward, everyone. I just wanted to ask you in the in a gas council and staff in moving forward on the 8th Street paving project to be mindful of the various impacts it's gonna have on the adjacent community, both the businesses, churches, and residents. Um, there were several people that came to speak at the recent planning meeting thinking it was on the agenda, and it was, but it really wasn't. Um, there are definitely a lot of points to consider. There's already some congestion and traffic flow issues with parking in parts of the area that's going to be impacted. And so I just ask you to consider the businesses and the pedestrians and the cyclists. I'm in favor of the bike lanes. I just think that taking all the parking away is going to create problems for a lot of my neighbors that I care about. I don't have a parking problem, but I care about the businesses and neighbors and everyone else and how it's going to impact them. So just please pay attention to the details of that project. Thank you. Thank you, Susie. All right, um, next is Stephen Paleo. Okay. I can hear you now, go ahead. Okay, sorry, sorry about that. Stephen Paleo, I own a couple of businesses in the city of Port Angeles, I'm also the President of the Olympic Peninsula Lodging Alliance and Treasurer for the Waterfront District Board. Uh, tonight, I'm not really speaking as uh, uh, representing any of those organizations, just more merely a member of our community. I just want to make sure you guys are aware, I missed the beginning of the meeting. I don't know if it was addressed, but this past Saturday, um, we had a great volunteer turnout for the Welcoming Vista uh, uh, work that was done. Um, and, it, and it was put on by, you know, Tom at North Olympic Land Trust. So I just want to make sure people acknowledge the effort that he's put on. This Remember, this was a goal from Elevate PA in the Waterfront District. Uh, we had Chamber of Commerce there with Mark Abshire. We had North Olympic Land Trust people there, multiple members from Olympic Peninsula Lodging Alliance, Holden Fleming and his entire family. Thank you to all of them. The next work party for this welcoming Vista is April 13th. Please mark your calendars there. Uh, secondarily, I just want to thank uh, Lindsay and Drew for the comments that they just made in the council report. They really echoed, in fact, Lindsay, you and I had a meeting in October last year where I first began to really highlight this vacant and blighted uh, property issue that we have. I was the one that suggested an urban blight tax that ratchets higher each month. So I really appreciate that council is listening and trying to bring these kind of uh, important topics and potential solutions to the forefront. That's all I have tonight. You guys take care. Thank you, Stephen. All right, and I see John, you changed your mind. Am I going? Yeah, John Ralston, City of Port Angeles. Uh, I'm hoping on the 8th Street uh, reconstruction from what, Lincoln to uh, C Street or thereabouts across both bridges doesn't eliminate any parking for the businesses. And I don't know, and I haven't asked the question of Mike, if bike lanes are really, uh, driving uh, the improvement on 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 8th Street. Um, personally, my experience with bike lanes, and I'm not a biker, but when I pull in and out of, in particular on 1st uh, Street from parking, people are using those bike lanes going both directions. So when you're looking to pull out in a lane within traffic, you now have to look the other way because some Bicyclists are coming in opposite direction of the traffic. It's very dangerous. So please don't eliminate any uh, parking spots. And I'm really not in favor of the bike lanes. From the people that bike a lot of miles they, that I talk to that are my acquaintances, they actually prefer not having biking lanes. <clears throat> Second thing on the blighted properties, 
I'd be surprised if there's 500 of them in town. I wouldn't be surprised if there's a couple hundred anyway. Uh, I'm looking for blighted properties all the time. There's at least five houses in town that I've been trying to buy for five years. They love their properties. They don't want to give them up for whatever reasons. They're behind on their taxes. They catch up at the end of the year. I don't know what you're going to do, but uh, it'll be a challenge. Thank you. Thank you, John. All right, last call. Okay, then we will end our second public comment period, and we will see you all at our next meeting. I don't even know what day it is right now. It's April 2nd, um, the second meeting of April, the 16th, I think. Yep, thank you very much, and have a good night.